from the moment that the doctor said we were going to have to do a C-section, I had a bad feeling, and I don't really know why. But after hours of pushing and no progress, it, the doctor determined that the baby was in the OP position, occipit posterior or something. But basically it means that the baby was facing up. And Katie simply didn't have any strength left. She was exhausted from pushing, and I'm sure she was somewhat relieved, honestly, when the doctor said that she'd be going into surgery. And so, as I washed my hands and got all suited up in the surgical attire, I said a quick prayer, asked for God's protection and blessing. Um, as I sat beside my wife, we impatiently waited to hear baby Ezekiel cry, you know, as, as proof that everything was okay. But then just moments after noticing my wife getting a little groggy during the surgery, we heard the sweet sound of our baby boy as he was carried over to the nurse's station. Katie smiled as if all was right in the world and then went to sleep. But about the same time, I heard the doctor announce to the surgical team that an artery had been cut and that she was losing a lot of blood. I could hear the uneasiness in his voice. It wasn't panic though, it, but you could tell he was nervous. And I saw blood streaming through the suction tubes away from my wife as the doctor said, we need some help in here. The nurse then quickly led me out of, out of the room with our new baby boy and I looked back at Katie and, and as I left the room I wondered if I'd ever see her again. And the nurses took me back and offered to let me hold Ezekiel and give him a bottle. Not knowing what else to do and telling myself that everything would be okay it would be fine like it always was. I sat down with him for, I don't know, a few minutes. But still, I couldn't think of anything. Nothing but my dear wife lying there on the table. So much that I even felt guilty for not being able to give attention to my new baby boy. And then I heard it over the hospital speakers. Code blue. We have a code blue in operating room two. entire life flashed before my eyes. I remember seeing our three children as I told them the news and I envisioned what it would be like for them growing up without her. I had to do something. I, I couldn't just sit there. It, it wasn't going to end like this. Not this way, at least not without a fight. The next thing I knew I was sitting outside this in a little room just outside the operating room, outside the entrance, and I was staring at the operating room doors, and I was storming heaven with more intensity and more relentless violence and prayer than I think I had ever known before. It's funny, there was there was no religious pretense. There were no these and nows and in fact half the time there weren't any words at all. It seems like in times like that, words aren't enough. They just won't do. There were only tears and a violent struggle within my spirit that seemed as if it were wanting to break free and fly up to heaven and demand its case before God. I don't know how long I sat there in that room praying and staring at the door, but I do know that the moment I sat down, I was pounding on the doors of heaven with my fist I didn't stop until the doctor came out and said that Katie was okay. But I now know what it means when the scripture says that Jacob wrestled with God. That he grabbed a hold of God and wouldn't give up without the blessing. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The scripture says that he struggled with God and that he prevailed. You know, Jacob got what he came for that night. But he didn't, he didn't come out of the experience without scars. He, the next morning, he was broken and limping. He would forever have a permanent reminder of this encounter with the living God. And I could identify with Jacob that night. I had been holding on to the promises of God my whole life. 
but it was now that I needed God to come through. It was now that I needed to know answered prayer like, like I never had before in my whole life. And I wasn't going home without my wife. I was staking everything on the one who said, ask and it will be given to you. Driven by a sense of utter desperation, I wrapped my arms and legs around the cross and I cried out to God. I felt like I was screaming from the top of my lungs without any decorum or sense of shame. I said, helper God, you promised. But the thing is, he, he never really specifically promised to heal my wife. Not in this life, at least. And I'm sure if there have been any proper theologians present, I'm sure they would have corrected me right then and there. I'm sure they would have reminded me of God's sovereignty and how I should acquiesce to his perfect will. We hear that kind of love, that talk a lot these days. But that's how the Pharisees talked. Yet as I've said before, I'm thankful that God is not nearly as religious as so many of his children. You have to admit there's something about desperate pleading and even violent praying that refuses to take no for an answer that gets a response from God. It pleases him. He seems to take delight in this type of faith. And we see it throughout the Bible. Over and over again, we see this type of prayer prevailing with the living God. The God of the Bible isn't proper. Not at all. He certainly isn't civilized. And he doesn't seem to care at all about fitting in within our biblical doctrines or our preconceived notions about who he is or how he's supposed to be or how he's supposed to act. No, our God is bigger than all that. As the scripture says, he is God and he does as he pleases. That's Psalm 115, verse 3. His behavior is anything but predictable and is sometimes even scandalous. Think about it. Jesus turned water into wine to keep a party going. He actually answered the prayers of demons in Matthew 8, 31. And he gave special recognition to a lying prostitute in James chapter 2. That chapter where great men and women of God are recognized for their faith. Our God refuses to be put in a theological box, and so don't allow the theological tight shorts to discourage you from seeking God and clinging to his promises and asking for whatever it is you want. You know, sometime after that night, I was reflecting on Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, where Jesus said, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I never understood that verse. I do now. May the grace of Jesus be with you. Amen.